uh, without uh, further delay, I will uh, introduce what is interventional radiology is. It's a medical specialty that uses image guidance such as X-rays, ultrasound, CT scans, and MRI to perform minimally invasive procedures for diagnostic and therapeutic purposes. So the interventional radiology is part of general radiology, but uh, the, the people who are doing the procedures have either special interest or train in uh, interventional uh, therapeutic procedures. And it is the, the main concept here is it is minimally invasive approach. So um, there will be, it is less invasive, safer, and more cost effective than traditional open surgeries and often require only local anesthesia and short hospital stay. So that is very important when it comes to pediatrics. Eranga, I hope you can hear me. Yeah, yeah I can hear you. Yeah, thank you. Uh, I will uh, briefly go through the first slide slides. Yeah, sure. Yeah. So there are two uh, types, uh, broad categories, non-vascular interventions and vascular interventions. In non-vascular interventions, in the pediatric population, we usually do the biopsies and drainages. When it comes to uh, the liver pathologies, the liver biopsies are very important. So it's a standard practice now to use image guidance, usually ultrasound, and it is a sterile technique uh, done under moderate sedation if the patient is not cooperative enough. So all the measures are taken to avoid uh, uh, bleeding and uh, just to make sure that we don't uh, damage the existing uh, vital structures. So um, it's now uh, we practice this as a, um, a, a ward procedure in our uh, department. So the coagulation profile is very important. Again, INR has to be less than 1.5 and uh, more than 100,000. But those are standard uh, rules, but uh, sometimes we um, uh, we uh, customize those parameters uh, according to the indication. And right. Then it comes when it comes to the uh, drains, drainages, the parasynthesis in uh, liver patients is again important. So as a routine, uh, the parasynthesis is done under image guidance currently. So the needle is placed in. Um, into the largest pocket uh, in the abdomen and the sterile technique is applied and the fluid is drained. Sometimes we may need to uh, put a pigtail if you want to drain for a few days. So the, uh, the, the usual size we use is seven French or eight French self-retaining uh, pigtails. So again, it uses the cell digger technique. We puncture the largest pocket and advance the needle and through that needle, um, we pass a wire over a wire. The track is dilated in, in order to accommodate the desired size of the pigtail. So the peritoneal drain insertions can be a sciatic drain and localized collection, so abscess drainage. Localized collections, again, image guidance is uh, very important. We usually uh, use the ultrasound, but also the CT, because the, in certain instances where the, the collection is very deep, such as a pelvic abscess, so you can't go through the vital structures by only looking at the sound scan. So on, in those patients, we may need uh, such as transgluteal approach or paravertebral approach. So the CT is uh, very important in those instances. Again, the ultrasound guidance, like I discussed earlier. Um, and this is one such good example of an um, abscess in the subhepatic or rather pancreatic bed region. This is the collection where the pigtail has been placed nicely um, without damaging the adjacent bubble. So in this patient, the CT was used, um, ideally with contrast. So again, then the procedure will be done in the CT scan room with, uh, with, uh, uh, with sedation. Eranga, would you like to add anything here? Uh, no, I think we'll go ahead like that. Uh, 
Right. Then thoracic procedures. When it comes to liver and the liver transplant, the the pleural aspiration is again very important. We have to make sure that the respiration is not compromised. So that's why we do our routine scans daily uh, in the first uh, uh, seven to 10 days. And we assess the, the pleural volumes. The getting a reactive pleural effusion is common, but you have to make sure the underlying, underlying um, lung is not compromised. Not only that, but also we should not allow the pleural effusion to be organized. Once it is organized, it is difficult to drain out, uh, such as the septations, the pleural thickening, and uh, insisted effusions and empyemas. So we have to make sure we tackle the situation at the correct time. So because uh, draining out completely a simple effusion is much, much easier than, uh, than managing a complex um, effusion. So this, um, this example shows the, the liver, the diaphragm, and this is the large, simple effusion. The biliary interventions. External biliary drain is commonly used uh, to relieve the obstructed biliary system temporarily. The imaging techniques are, uh, the modalities we use are the ultrasound and the fluoroscopy. So whenever possible, fluoroscopy is mandatory in order to um, prevent uh, compl complications. So we puncture um, the bile duct and get into, into the system over a wire. The tract is uh, dilated and a desired uh, size of a pigtail, such as eight French or sometimes 10 French if the, uh, if the bile is going to be passed, uh, placed. And usually we apply a locking pigtail. You can go and read about that. There are two types of uh, pigtails. One is self-retaining pigtails and the other one is locking pigtails. The locking pigtail, the advantage is when we um, pull and uh, put the knot, the pigtail won't straighten up uh, unless we cut the thread. So the anchoring is much safer. Uh, spontaneous um, pull out is uh, very rare. So uh, whenever possible, we use locking pigtails for external biliary drains. Likewise, we can internalize the, the drain. Um, when the ERCP, uh, like Melanthi uh, told just now that ERCP uh, may be a, a challenging procedure in pediatrics. So, but with sedation, we can approach anti-greatly and we can cross the strictures over a wire and put a stent. If it is going to be a temporary measure, we can put a plastic stent same as in ERCP, and or if it is going to be a, a permanent uh, solution, then a metal stent is placed across the uh, stricture. Not only a single stent, but also we can uh, we can um, put stent in stent. Once a stent is placed, one side starts drains, but after sometimes the other side, uh, for instance, the the left lobe uh, can get obstructed. So what we do is we integrately puncture the the left side and get into, into the, uh, the stent and through the stent we put another stent. So that is you call stented stent or we can put parallel stents as well. Parallel versus stented stent. So likewise we can um, we can add the number of uh, stents. So this this is a percutaneous approach done under ultrasound guidance and fluoroscopy. Uh, can I add something Chita? Yes Ranga. Sure. And uh, in, in pediatric practice, mainly uh, we don't really see these kind of tumors in pediatric practice. But we come across patients who have undergone, especially for hepatoblastoma resections, and then post-surgically you might get biliary strictures, and then you get biliary leakage. And then might you might need to externally drain the biliary system so that the biliary, uh, I mean, the damage or the, the stricture can be uh, deal with later. And then, of course, in especially in pediatric transplant, liver transplant, also you will get these biliary strictures, especially patients who have a, a, a vascular compromise, especially the arterial. If you get an arterial stenosis and a hypoxia, they are very prone to get biliary strictures. But in uh, usually in transplant patients, you won't see much of dilatation intrahepatically post uh, transplant. 
then what we have to do is we have to puncture the uh, the uh, biliary tract under fluoroscopy or even maybe ultrasonically and it will be a blind puncture but when you get the access you can dilate and do whatever you want you can put an external biliary drainage or you can put an internal biliary drainage till you get it uh, sorted out uh, because uh, these strictures sometimes you need to deal it early otherwise it will be a permanent stricture uh, which, which will compromise the future liver functions as well. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Right. Uh, from that, now we are going to move into the vascular interventions. There are a wide variety of uh, interventions we carry out, starting from the vascular accesses, then transjugular liver biopsies, hepatic venoplasty, and stenting in transplantations. Portal vein embolizations, hepatic artery angiogram and angioplasties, splenic artery, and uh, hepatic tumor embolizations. So these are some of the examples. When it comes to vascular access, sometimes we may help the clinicians and the surgeons uh, to, uh, to gain the access. Uh, for instance, this is a uh, peak line. So peripherally inserted central catheter, where we puncture the brachial uh, vein or the cephalic uh, vein and getting into the system and the the tip the cent central tip is placed at the cavo atrial junction so these uh, peak lines are very important when it comes to long term antibiotics and sometimes parenteral nutrition then uh, sometimes we may come across with difficult cannulation of the central uh, systems the ijv and the subclavian so uh, some um, sometimes uh, we help the clinicians to get the access and um, we, we have done uh, complicated uh, central uh, venous accesses uh, use, using fluoroscopy. We do the venoplasty and then put a, uh, get the vascular access. Transjugular liver biopsy. It's a very important uh, technique adapted to get the uh, liver samples where the coagulation profile is not suitable for percutaneous approach. The access is from the IJV under fluoroscopy guidance we get in into the system and goes into the uh, intrahepatic IVC and um, um, by doing uh, fluoroscopy and venograms, uh, hepatic venograms, we select one of the um, right, uh, either right or the middle hepatic veins and get in into the liver parenchyma and get the, uh, the sample. So the advantage is there is no um, the, uh, the risk of bleeding into the either into the, uh, the, the outer surface or into the peritoneum, but rather the, the liver will bleed, bleed, will bleed into the cardiovascular system. So the, the, the bleeding uh, or the complication risk is very minimal. Using the same technique, TIPS procedure is adapted. Uh, transjugular intrahepatic portosystemic shunt. That is the treatment, one of the treatments for portal hypertension where you uh, create a tunnel between the hepatic vein uh, into the portal vein. Usual uh, access is from the right port, uh, hepatic vein into the right portal vein, like this uh, uh, diagram. So this is how you see once the stent is placed. So again, a transjugular approach. So once the stent started from the, the intrahepatic uh, IVC, the tunnel, and we have uh, get, uh, uh, inserted the stent into the portal system. So once the final venogram is done, you will see the almost all the uh, portal blood will shunt through the stent into the heart. So that is the, the concept of uh, tips. Eranga? Yeah. Uh, so usually this is to reduce the portal uh, venous pressure into the liver vein in a uh, chronic liver disease. And you can also do splenic artery embolization to reduce the uh, preload of the liver as well. And then sometimes when you do the tips, you might have to do the variceal coiling and uh, yeah, because those are the, the ones which we can bleed from the esophageal varices or even the dilated gastric varices, you can embolize them so that the patient won't bleed uh, later on and uh, can move to the next slide. Yeah. 
So this is a okay. usually a, a very well established practice where you do uh, when you have one sided uh, liver lesion, especially in the right lobe, the liver, the residual liver remnant, which is the left lobe, is not good enough or not sufficient enough for a survival of the, the patient. Then you go and embolize the portal vein, which is the principal vascular supply for the liver. When you embolize that, then you will get a hypertrophy of the remaining uh, liver. And then what you do is we you do a volumetric assessment pre portal vein embolization. Then we usually, if it is a non cirrhotic liver, you can do a post embolization volumetry in about a week's time, uh, four weeks. But if it is a cirrhotic, then you should do it in about six weeks' time. Then you do a reassessment of the portal uh, residual liver remnant. And if it is satisfactory by the surgeons, if we think, then you can go ahead and do the resection as well as you can do tumor embolizations, especially uh, in pediatrics if you have hemangioendotheliomas. This is a, a, a image of portal vein embolization. Uh, hold, hold, hold on, Aranga. Uh, yeah, tumor embolization, this one? Yeah, this is a tumor embolization. This is a, a patient who had a, a large hypervascular tumor and the surgeons want us to go and embolize it before the uh, uh, tumor is taken out so that it shrinks and then it gives a clear margin for the surgeons to go and take the lesion out. So in pediatrics, you do it for hemangioendotheliomas and there are some other vascular hepatic tumors, especially in neonates, where you might have to do these uh, embolizations prior to the surgery. As well as uh, in in the, uh, this is uh, uh, this is portal uh, vein uh, embolization. Uh, you can do it either from ipsilateral or contralateral. That means you uh, do it, if you are doing a right portal vein embolization, you can access the right portal vein itself and do it, which is technically a little difficult, but which is the preferred method because you are not damaging the future uh, saving liver part of the uh, future liver remnant. So you can do it either way, but it's always better to do it on the same side because you are not touching the, the future liver uh, remnant, which is going to be the... Uh, liver functioning, functioning liver of that patient, particular patient. And then, of course, we have uh, vascular, other, uh, we do hepatic angiogram, especially the patients who had undergone uh, transplant, where you can see this is just a, a diagnosed hepatic angiogram. You get the access from a vascular sheet in the groin and you selectively catheterize, and then you do the angiogram to see whether there's any stenosis, whether there's any abnormal tumor blushes. And if there's any stenosis, you can always do angioplasty. Here's a case where you can see that the, the, there's an anastomotic stricture. Then you do a plasty and if you want, you can put a stent even. So these are the things that uh, the interventional radiologist can help in uh, liver uh, disease management and post-transplant management. And especially if you get post-transplant abscess collections or vascular compromise or biliary collections, all uh, in all instances, the intervention of radiology can help in uh, certain ways so that the patient doesn't need to undergo a second uh, surgery. And this is a patient who had a, a split, uh, hepatic uh, transplant, which we thought there was a vascular obstruction or the outflow obstruction, which from the venogram we thought that it is not. And then we, what we did, we did a uh, portal, uh, the splenic artery embolization so that the portal vein get less and the uh, uh, patient survived and uh, did very well with the poor, uh, liver transplant as well. So there are certain things that uh, uh, for us to do as uh, interventional radiologists for the transplant as well as for the uh, liver disease in children. And um, it's quite a quite a challenge at some times, but it's quite uh, interesting and uh, happy to help all the time. So like I said, the intraoperative vascular access and intraoperative imaging are important tools uh, when it comes to the liver transplant. And uh, post-transplant, uh, like Eranga told, the percutaneous drainage of fluid and collections, then uh, sometimes tips and embolization of hepatic artery for pseudoaneurysms. So those are very important adjunct treatment options. And uh, we should not forget uh, follow-up imaging is is also very much important. So not only the short term, but intermediate and a long term follow up, especially with Doppler studies. 
So in summary, interventional radiology plays a crucial role in the pre, intra, and post-operative phases of liver transplantation by providing imaging guidance and performing procedures to ensure successful transplant and manage any complications that may arise. So with that note, we would like to conclude our presentation. Uh, over to you, Meranti, and uh, we would like to answer any questions if there's any.